Θα ξεκινήσουμε τον πέμπτο κύκλο των συζητήσεων. Ε, αφού πρώτα δούμε ένα βιντεοσκοπημένο μήνυμα του Επιτρόπου ε, Απασχόλησης και Κοινωνικών Υποθέσεων του Λάζλο Άντορ, ο οποίος ε, δεν μπόρεσε να έρθει στην Αθήνα. Και στη συνέχεια θα ακολουθήσουν οι παρουσιάσεις από τους εκλεκτούς ομιλητές για, για το θέμα, το οποίο είναι τι άλλο η ανεργία και για το αν οι πολιτικές, οι πολιτικές μπορούν να δώσουν κάποια λύση, κάποια διέξοδο. Να ξεκινήσουμε με το μήνυμα του Επιτρόπου. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry I cannot be in Athens today to address you in person, but I'm grateful for the chance to send you this short message. I congratulate the Levy Institute on their endeavor to tackle the growth and employment challenges posed by the continuing Euro area debt crisis which has had a very severe impact on Greece in particular. It clearly continues to be a hard upward struggle to reconcile the need to restore public finances with the need to support growth and maintain social protection. The problem lies in the original design of the euro area, which relies on national surveillance and national fiscal capacities to deal with asymmetric shocks. The European Union has done a lot to step up coordination of fiscal and structural policies and to provide emergency lending to countries at the edge of insolvency. But the twin processes of fiscal consolidation and internal devaluation have had a severe impact on the economic and social situation in these countries. They are still struggling to achieve an economic recovery and there is a lot of social damage that needs to be undone. This requires urgent support. The experience of countries like Greece or Portugal should also teach us to take a longer-term perspective on the functioning of our economic and monetary union. We need to redesign this project in order to be sustainable and legitimate and to enable balanced growth in all member states sharing the single currency. Our communication published last month on strengthening the social dimension of the Economic and Monetary Union seeks to do this by enhancing the surveillance of employment and social challenges, strengthening the coordination of employment and social policies, and improving social dialogue, both at European and national levels. The Commission has put together a scoreboard of five key indicators that would help detect major employment and social problems which need to be tackled in order to ensure good functioning of the single currency. These indicators are unemployment, youth unemployment and inactivity, gross household disposable income, the at-risk of poverty rate, and income inequalities measured by the ratio between the richest and poorest 20% of the population in each country. On this basis, and as part of the established processes of economic policy coordination, we hope to ensure that timely action is taken by the Monetary Union as a whole to tackle these challenges. Because it is clear that the single currency is not generating the benefits it should if some member countries' employment and social situation is steadily worsening while other countries do well. Over time, such collective action by the Monetary Union could also draw upon a common budget. Some examples can be found already now, notably the agreement by EU leaders to allocate 6 billion euros to the so-called Youth Employment Initiative. This money is targeted at regions with a youth unemployment rate above 25% and aims to help them deliver a new EU-wide policy known as the Youth Guarantee. The Youth Guarantee seeks to ensure that all young people receive a good quality offer of employment, a traineeship or an apprenticeship, or the chance to continue their education or training within four months of becoming unemployed or leaving school. It starts from the realization that young people are particularly hard hit by the crisis and that the cyclical downturn can seriously damage their lifetime prospects. The Youth Guarantee is a comprehensive scheme 
that seeks to prevent the long-term scarring effects of unemployment and inactivity on young people. The 6 billion euros I mentioned will help the worst affected regions by funding notably education and training providers and active labour market policies. Its advantage is the fact that the EU member states can use EU funds to invest in skills and training and focus on the young. This is all the more important when public finances are tight and there is even more pressure on national funds due to high unemployment and rising poverty. Because the funding behind the youth guarantee is targeted at regions with particularly high youth unemployment and is scheduled to be disbursed within two years, there is a certain counter-cyclical element to it. At the same time, the youth guarantee represents a systemic effort to improve the school-to-work transitions across Europe and thereby to boost employment and productivity. It is a key structural reform that countries need to implement. But 6 billion euros is clearly not enough to overcome the youth unemployment crisis or the larger economic and social crisis we are facing. In the longer term, an autonomous euro area budget is needed that could provide the euro area with a fiscal capacity to help individual member states absorb asymmetric shocks. It could involve a stabilization scheme funded by net contributions in good times and net receipts in bad times. It could also involve earmarking payments from the fund for a specific purpose with counter-cyclical effects, for example, to co-finance unemployment benefits. For political acceptance, any such scheme should aim to avoid lasting transfers between member countries to prevent net losers or net beneficiaries. Putting this in place would also require further pooling of sovereignty and wider competence at the level of the monetary union, and most such schemes would demand treaty changes. But it is clearly something which the monetary union needs for its longer-term sustainability, and we need to work already now to prepare such mechanism. I look forward to your suggestions in this respect, and I wish you a very successful conference. Μπορούμε να ξεκινήσουμε τη συζήτησή μας. Στο θέμα απλώ θα ήθελα να προσθέσω, να θέσω μάλλον καταρχάς ορισμένες πινελιές σύντομα. Το ζήτημα, το ερώτημα για το αν οι φυστάμενες πολιτικές απασχόλησης ή η εν γέννη πολιτική που εφαρμόζεται μπορεί να ανατάξει αυτή την ανωδική πορεία που έχει ανεργία, ε, δεν νομίζω ότι μπορεί να απαντηθεί αν δεν θέσουμε ένα ερώτημα πριν από αυτό. Αν υπήρξαν πολιτικές και ποιες είναι αυτές. Ε, πολύ έτσι σύντομα θα ήθελα να σας πω ότι κατά τη γνώμη μου υπήρξαν τρεις κύκλοι πολιτικών για την απασχόληση από το 2008 μέχρι σήμερα. Και λέω από το 2008 γιατί για την άνοδο της ανεργίας στη χώρα μας η χρηματοπιστωτική κρίση έτσι όπως εκδηλώθηκε ήδη από το 2008 είχε την επίπτωσή της ήδη σε ορισμένους κλάδους οι οποίοι είχαν οδηγηθεί, είχαν αρχίσει ήδη να οδηγούνται σε μεγάλη απαξίωση και σε εκροές μεγάλες από την αγορά εργασίας με πρώτη και χαρακτηριστικότερη αυτήν του μετάλλου με πρώτο χαρακτηριστικότερο κλάδο αυτού του μετάλλου ε, ήδη από το 2008, ο συνδυασμός χρηματοπιστωτικής και ναυτιλιακής κρίσης δημιουργεί μεγάλες απώλειες στις ε, ναυπηγοεπισκευαστικές ζώνες της χώρας με πρώτη αυτή του περάματος του Πειραιά. Η τότε κυβέρνηση, ενώ έχει ήδη διαπιστώσει το ρεύμα που έρχεται από την κρίση και από τα προβλήματα που εκδηλώθηκαν μετά εν υπόθηκα δάνεια στις ΗΠΑ, και βλέπει ότι φτάνει το ρεύμα, δεν μπορεί και δεν παίρνει κανένα απολύτως μέτρο. Περνάνε σχεδόν δύο χρόνια χωρίς να έχουμε καμία απολύτως πολιτική ή υποπολιτική, αν θέλετε ε, να την χαρακτηρίσουμε ως τέτοια, για την απασχόληση. Ακόμα και αυτά τα προγράμματα απασχόλησης, δηλαδή τα προγράμματα της ενεργούς κατόνομα και σύμφωνα με την Ευρωπαϊκή Επιτροπή και τον Επίτροπο ε, ενεργα... τα κατόνομα ενεργά προγράμματα, προγράμματα ενεργής πολιτικής που λειτουργούν ουσιαστικά σαν επιδόματα, αυτή είναι η ουσιαστική του σημασία δηλαδή λειτουργούν ουσιαστικά ως παθητικές πολιτικές και αυτά, όχι μόνο στην Ελλάδα αλλά και στην Ευρώπη κατά τη γνώμη μου 
δεν μπορούν και δεν ενεργοποιούνται σε αυτή τη φάση. Η ελληνική κοινωνία χάνει ε, δύο έτη μιας, ε, από μια σχετική βοήθεια, μια σχετική ανακούφιση που θα μπορούσε να δοθεί σε ένα τμήμα της μεταποίησης, το οποίο αρχίζει και βγαίνει εκτός αγοράς. Ο δεύτερος κύκλος των πολιτικών απασχόλησης, μιλάμε πάντα για την περίοδο της κρίσης, εντοπίζεται από το 2010 και μετά, όταν έχουμε ένα δηλό πλην αρκετά όμως σημαντικό νομοσχέδιο, με το οποίο αρχίζουν να ενδυναμώνονται οι ευελιξίες στην αγορά εργασίας. Είναι το περίφημο νομοσχέδιο του 2010 επί Υπουργείας Άντρια Λοβέρδου. Ε, γιατί το αναφέρω αυτό. Γιατί από το 2010 και μετά και με το μνημόνιο, στη συνέχεια, ασκείται για πρώτη φορά, κατά τη γνώμη μου, συγκροτημένη πολιτική για την απασχόληση, ε, η οποία στον πυρήνα τη έχει την μεγάλη ευελιξία της αγοράς εργασίας, ρυθμίσεις για την όλο και μεγαλύτερη ευελιξία, με την αποδιάρθρωση του εργατικού δικαίου, με την άρση των προστατευτικών διατάξεων, την άρση και των υπερπροστατευτικών διατάξεων, που σε ορισμένε περιπτώσει έπρεπε ήδη να έχουν αλλάξει. Όλο αυτό γίνεται πάρα πολύ απότομα και δεν είναι υπερβολή να πούμε ότι μέσα σε 24 ώρε άλλαξε όλο το εργατικό δίκαιο και όλη η, εργα... όλη η σύμβαση που είχε... είχαμε πάνω στο κομμάτι ε, τη εργασία και της απασχόλησης και των συμβάσεων. Ε, αυτή η μεγάλη αλλαγή χαιρετίστηκε τότε από πολλούς συναδέλφους, από οικονομολόγους, από θεωρητικούς της εργασίας, από εργατολόγους, ως η μεγάλη τομή που έπρεπε να κάνει η ελληνική κοινωνία για να μπορέσουν επιτέλους να ανοίξουν οι δουλειές. Ε, γι' αυτό και την ονομάζω ως τη μοναδική πολιτική απασχόληση, ανεξαρτήτως από το πιο πρόσημο μπορούμε να τη δώσουμε αρνητική ή θετική. Ε, ήταν η εποχή, θα θυμόμαστε όλοι, φυσικά όχι οι ξένοι καλεσμένοι μας, οι οποίοι έχουν πολύ πιο σοβαρά πράγματα να κάνουν από το να βλέπουν την ελληνική τηλεόραση, ε, ήταν η χρυσή εποχή για τους Έλληνες εργατολόγους και για τους οικονομολόγους της αγοράς εργασίας. Κυρίως αυτούς της κλασικής σχολής. Έτσι, της κλασικής σχολής. Ε, θεωρούσαν ότι ανοίγει πραγματικά ένας νέος δρόμος για την απασχόληση, για την αύξηση απασχόληση. Βεβαίως, τα αποτελέσματα τους διέψευσαν και τους διέψευσαν νικτρά. Και όσο τους διέψευδαν τα αποτελέσματα, τόσο άρχισαν να εξαφανίζονται αυτές οι φωνές από το δημόσιο διάλογο. Ε, τα αποτελέσματα είναι γνωστά. Η ανεργία προσεγγίζει το 30%. Διότι ναι, μεν ο δείκτης της Ελστάτ είναι κάπου στο 27,6-27,7% αλλά πρέπει να λάβουμε υπόψη μας ότι υπάρχει ένα μεγάλο κομμάτι, ένα προσδιορίστα, απροσδιορίστο αριθμητικά κομμάτι, το οποίο εργάζεται και δεν αμείβεται και παραμένει 6-7 μήνες χωρίς να παίρνει μισθούς. Υπάρχει, υπάρχει αυτό το κομμάτι σε όλους τους κλάδους, υπάρχει και στο δημοσιογραφικό, υπάρχει στη μεταποίηση, υπάρχει παντού. Άρα υπάρχει μια κρυφή ανεργία η οποία δεν υπολογίζεται. Ε, δεν πρέπει... Ίσως να πω τώρα, αλλά θα το θέσω έτσι στην αρχή της συζήτησης, ότι και η πρόβλεψη του Λεβί Ινστιτούτου είναι πάρα πολύ σημαντική. Εμένα προσωπικά, αν και ασχολούμαι 20 χρόνια με το κομμάτι, η προοπτική του να φτάσει στο 34% η ανεργία μέχρι το 2016, μου προκαλεί τρόμο. Ε, άρα και αυτός και ο, ο κύκλος της πολιτικής απασχόλησης απέτυχε παντελώ. Δεν νομίζω ότι... Έχει κανείς αμφιβολία ότι η μεγάλη, η απότομη, η ευνίδια, η σοκαριστική ευελιξία η οποία υπήλθε με τις μνημονιακές δεσμεύσεις και να κάνω εδώ μια παρένθεση, η, τα εργασιακά, πολύ συναρτημένα και δεμένα με την απασχόληση είναι η μοναδική μνημονιακή δέσμευση στην οποία οι ελληνικές κυβερνήσεις στήρισαν το λόγο τους 100%. Ε, πραγματικά εδώ επέτυχε πλήρως το μνημόνιο, έτσι και η ελληνική κυβέρνηση πέτυχε. Ο τρίτος κύκλος, και τελειώνω με αυτό γιατί ε, σημαντικότερε είναι οι τοποθετήσει των εκλεκτών ομιλητών, ε, αφορά τις, αυτό που είπαμε και πριν, τις ενεργές πολιτικές απασχόλησης, οι οποίες επανέρχονται τώρα ε, με μια σειρά προγράμματα, τα οποία όμως ουσιαστικά είναι και αυτά τι είναι προγράμματα προνοιακού χαρακτήρα, οι ενεργές πολιτικές δεν είναι τίποτα άλλο και σε όλη την Ευρώπη, όπως αποδεικνύουν τα, ε, τα συμπεράσματα που έχουμε και οι εκθέσεις, από ένα μηχανισμό επιδοματικής πολιτικής, ουσιαστικά παθητικής πολιτικής. Έχουν αποτύχει. 
Και αυτό φαίνεται από ένα και μόνο στοιχείο που θα σας δώσω για τη χώρα μας. Στην περίοδο 2007-2013, από τις παρεμβάσεις του επιχειρησιακού προγράμματος του Υπουργείου Εργασίας Ανάπτυξη Ανθρώπινου Δυναμικού, δηλαδή του προγράμματος που υποστηρίζεται και χρηματοδοτείται στο μεγάλο του μέρος από το Ευρωπαϊκό Κοινωνικό Ταμείο, ε, δαπανίσαμε 3 δισεκατομμύρια, 111 εκατομμύρια ευρώ, δηλαδή σε όλη αυτή την πενταετία και δαπανούμε ακόμα, υπάρχουν υπόλοιπα, με ωφελημένους 783.853 ανθρώπους. Ε, και λέω ανθρώπους, δεν είναι μόνο άνεργοι, είναι και εργαζόμενοι, διότι εμείς στην Ελλάδα, στο κονδύλι ανεργία απασχόληση, βάζουμε και την κατάρτιση, βάζουμε και τους παιδικούς σταθμούς, βάζουμε και τους αποφυλακιστέντες, τα βάζουμε όλα. Δεν έχουμε δηλαδή, δεν κάνουμε κανένα διαχωρισμό. Λοιπόν, τώρα, πόσο ωφελημένοι είναι αυτοί, είναι ένα ζήτημα όταν από το 2013, οπότε έχουμε τη συμφωνία, την υλοποίηση της συμφωνίας για τα 3,111 δις, αρχίζει μάλλον να ενεργοποιείται το ποσό αυτό, οι άνεργοι από 139.000 το 2007, δεύτερο τρίμηνο του 2007, φτάνουν εσύ ως το δεύτερο τρίμηνο του 2013 1.350.000. Αυτό είναι γνωστό, θα μου πείτε. Αυτό που έχει σημασία είναι ότι ενώ το 2007 οι μακροχρόνια άνεργοι δεν ξεπερνούσαν τις 208.000, σήμερα ξεπερνούν τις 900.000. Και αυτό είναι αποτέλεσμα της τριετίας. Τέλος, ένας μισός κύκλος έχει ξεκινήσει το τελευταίο χρονικό διάστημα, τους τελευταίους τρει μήνες. Είναι συνδεδεμένος με την προσπάθεια αφομοίωσης από την ελληνική κοινωνία, αυτού που λέμε success story, και έχει σχέση με τις ροές απασχόλησης. Ενώ η ανεργία είναι το υπαριθμό, είναι ένα πρόβλημα για όλες τις οικογένειες, ξαφνικά όλοι έπρεπε να συζητούμε για τις ροές απασχόλησης, διότι το Υπουργείο Εργασίας και αυτή του την εκτίμηση την έχουν ενστερνιστεί και ευρωπαϊκή, ε, ευρωπα... ε, στελέχη της Ευρωπαϊκής Ένωσης και αναλυτές ε, τραπεζών και πραγματικά δημιουργεί έτσι μια εντύπωση αυτό το πράγμα, πώς τόσο άκρητα. Έχουμε μία αύξηση των ροών απασχόλησης, δηλαδή έχουμε μία αύξηση των προσλήψεων έναντι των απολύσεων τους τελευταίους μήνες. Ε, στοιχείο το οποίο βέβαια πλέον δεν αποτυπώνεται στις ανακοινώσεις τις κυβερνητικές, έχουν πέσει λίγο οι τόνοι, διότι κατά τη γνώμη μου είναι μάλλον συγκυριακό, έχει σχέση με την μεγάλη αύξηση που είχαμε στον τουρισμό, και βεβαίως συνδέεται και με τα πρόστιμα, δηλαδή με τα διοικητικά μέτρα. Άρα, ε, αγαπητοί φίλοι, σε αυτή τη φάση, από τη μεγάλη ευελιξία και την απελευθέρωση των μέτρων, που έδινε την αίσθηση σε ένα μεγάλο κοινό της ελληνικής κοινωνίας ότι θα επιτύχουμε ρυθμούς κινητικότητας αντίστοιχους με την αγορά εργασίας των Ηνωμένων Πολιτειών, όλοι πιστεύαν ότι θα γίνουμε μια Αμερική σε αυτό το κομμάτι, Έχουμε ξαναγυρίσει στα διοικητικά μέτρα παρέμβαση αγορά εργασία με υψηλά πρόστιμα. Αυτή, κατά τη γνώμη μου, είναι, η διακυ... είναι κάπω οι διακυμάνσει χοντρικά. Δεν είναι μια πρόχειρη έτσι. Θα ήθελα όμω ε, να δώσω το λόγο στου ομιλητέ ε, για να μα πούνε πολύ πιο ενδιαφέροντα πράγματα. Και να ξεκινήσουμε με τον Ντούνκαν Κάμπελ, το εξέχον στέλεχο του Διεθνού Γραφείου Εργασία. Φυσικά, για όλους τους ομιλητές μπορείτε να δείτε τα στοιχεία του στο πρόγραμμα που έχετε. Mr. Campbell, please. Okay. You have it. I got it. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. And um, I'm delighted to be here, and I thank the Levy Institute for inviting me. Uh, Christina just gave my speech. So I can sit down, I think, pretty much. But, no, I think um, I'm glad that we're finally coming down to earth um, in this conference, which has been extremely exciting. But we haven't really dealt with the damage on the ground yet. And uh, I think that's what's important to do. Uh, active labor market policies are wonderful things uh, if there were any demand in the economy. Uh, unfortunately, without demand in the economy, active labor market policies do nothing for you. Right? Um, the youth guarantee that Commissioner Andor was talking about is a wonderful idea. I'm fully, fully supportive of it. There's no empirical record that it works, right, except out of it, Finland and, uh, and Austria. So we'll have to see how things go, uh, go, go forward. Let me uh, see if I'm doing this right. Yeah. 
this is just, you know, to say that this is from a paper that we're working on. We've been very attentive to Greece um, uh, over these past months to, to such an extent, and I really have to emphasize this, that our director general at the ILO has actually opened an office here. We didn't have an office in, in Greece. We have one now. It's uh, staffed by my, my colleague, Konstantino Papadakis. And um, uh, that, th th that just shows the, the earnestness with which we want to uh, try and offer our services to, uh, in, in any way we can to um, what's happening in Greece. Um, OK. First of all, uh, uh, Christina gave you some of the numbers. And um, uh, they're, they're indeed even bleaker than mine. Um, uh, 27 percent official unemployment, uh, 64 percent youth unemployment. Uh, the numbers are not going to go down. And um, oh, thanks. That one doesn't work. They both work. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, they're not going to go down. But the um, the message that we're getting out of uh, a, a number of um, uh, in intelligent publications these days is that things are bad, but getting less bad. Right? Uh, in other words, that's not the same as thing, things are bad, they're getting better. No, they're getting less bad. So if you look at the last report from um, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the monthly report of the Bank of Greece, uh, you'll find sentences such as, you know, the rate of increase in unemployment is diminishing, okay? Or the decline in GDP growth is diminishing. In other words, it's still continuing. Right? but it's getting less bad. So I'd like to take a look at um, uh, what these very, very, very pale green shoots of um, quasi-optimism might look like. Here we have um, the monthly unemployment rate. It's just saying uh, exactly what I, over time, up, up, up until January 13th at any rate, what we're seeing is a decline in the rate of increase in unemployment that is nonetheless increasing. And yes, um, as Christina said, I think you know 30% is not uh, an unreasonable figure that I've talked to with the, the policy community here. And the, the Levy Institute says 34%, uh, not out of the bounds of, uh, of, of probability. In any case, uh, the rate of increase in unemployment has been declining since the last quarter of 2012. And I suppose that's uh, you know, it, good news to a certain extent. Similarly, um, you know, we look at... Uh, the job creation and job destruction rates since the crisis. A perfect X, right? Where, where the green is job destruction, where the blue is job creation. Right? Uh, and uh, as you can see, uh, they, they do not meet. So where's the optimism in this? The optimism in this is in the very last quarter represented on the figure, where there seems to be an uptick in job creation and where job destruction is in fact seems to be leveling out more or less. So that's, that's the optimistic picture in this figure. Um, same thing with, um, the, for the young people, people under the age of 25. Slight uptick in job creation, slight leveling off, very slight leveling off in, in job destruction. So this is where we're getting our, our statements that things seem to be um, you know, uh, at a turning point of some sort or another. Um, I would call attention, nonetheless, to um, where we stand now. Um, and let me just leave the mic for a minute and just point. These two bottom numbers. Just that very southern uh, south uh, quadrant on the uh, left-hand side shows uh, the picture. The, uh, the fact of the matter is that the finding and separation rates of, um, uh, of, uh, of job search are still quite dismal. Right? Separation rates are still high. Right? The probability of finding a job is de decreasing over, over the years, as you can see. Right? Now, uh, what conclusion can we draw from that? Labor market's in a bad place, certainly. But we can draw another conclusion, and it's called structural unemployment. Structural unemployment is when you're out of the job for so long right, that you lose your skills, you can't find another one, you lose work discipline, you lose whatever. Right? And, and, the, and the key feature of structural unemployment relative to cyclical unemployment is that macroeconomic policy doesn't work for structural unemployment. Right? In other words, other policies must tick in. Education, training, retraining, whatever it happens to be. 
Now, we don't have much data on structural unemployment in Greece, simply because the typical way of measuring that is the you know, unemployment rate relative to vacancies. Uh, and we have no vacancies in Greece, so it's hard to measure the degree of structural unemployment. But with a long-term unemployment rate in this country of about 67 percent, in other words, 67 percent of all the unemployed are long-term unemployed in Greece, I think we can assume that uh, Greece inter alia is looking at a profound structural unemployment problem. Okay, this is the employment rate over time. And again, the optimism, the pale green shoots, uh, is at the very tail end where we see that the employment rate is slightly increasing. This is good news if it's measured uh, appropriately. It might not be measured appropriately. By that I mean, um, you know, if you have a major recession, as, as, uh, as you've gone through and continue to go through, as Asia went through in the late 1990s, then one, one finds actually that labor supply increases. Right? I remember I was, in, I was posted in Bangkok at the time, the white collar worker lost his job and hauled out the whole family onto the street to sell vegetables. Okay, that's an increase in the employment rate. Right? Is it a healthy increase in the employment rate is the question. And so I think we have to look at these figures uh, from the standpoint also of, of the quality of jobs that are being on offer. Um, Jan Kregel yesterday said something very accurate indeed, um, that you can't really blame productivity in Greece uh, for the problem of um, competitiveness in Greece. And that's very true, but um, he was talking about productivity. He was not talking about unit labor costs. Right? Unit labor costs are, of course, productivity plus the wages that you pay people to get that product out. Right? I think what we see here is that unit labor costs shot up in Greece in the first decade of the 2000s. Right? And with the labor market flexibility reforms that, uh, that you mentioned, Christina, uh, unit labor costs have come down. As we all know, there's been a 22% decline in the minimum wage, a 32% decline in the youth minimum wage, and a general decline of about 15 to 20% of real wages as a result of the crisis. This improves unit labor costs. Right? It doesn't improve, really, uh, the situation of the labor market. So what is my argument here? Was there a problem? Well, arguably, arguably. Uh, that previous slide that I just showed suggested that irrespective of productivity increases, wages outstripped them. So wages came, you know, were, were separating themselves from productivity gains in the economy, and certainly that can't be sustainable for a long time. Right? Uh, so was there a problem? I'm saying yes. Was it the problem? I'm saying no. There's been some equation, I've even heard it in these past two days here, of uh, competitiveness and wages. Right? Well, I'm sorry, that's not the only variable that matters for competitiveness. And in, uh, my argument here in Greece would be that wages are perhaps the least important component of competitiveness when you look at what's going on in the economy. I would, I would argue that product market regulation is an issue. I would argue that bureaucracy is an issue. I would argue that all sorts of uh, problems in export diversification are an issue. I would, pro I would argue probably that the stagnation of the manufacturing sector is an issue, that I would rank higher in the what's, pro what's the problem with competitiveness story than I would with whatever happened to wages. So in the labor market, we have that. You know, we have that first issue that I just mentioned where I say, you know, I'm discounting the wage issue here. Uh, and obviously, we have no fiscal space in this economy uh, to spend our way into the labor market. Um, and the downside consequences of labor market reform is that, you know, it, let's face it, um, Wages are the fungible thing if you're in a Eurozone economy. It's the only thing you can really change. You, can't, you have no control over macroeconomic policies if you're sharing the currency. So where, where's, the, uh, where's the likely soft spot to push? And that's certainly the labor market. We've already heard about Germany this morning. Right? The German uh, kind of mercantilist success in its exports. Uh, is that unrelated to the fact that there has been wage repression in Germany for about 20 years? I don't think so. Right? So that's the only thing, the, the only button to push, and that's certainly the button that has been pushed here in Greece. It's been pushed particularly in the private sector, but not only there. 
it hits through the consumption channel. And you know, th th this, is, this is probably my main theme. Uh, uh, it, it, the, the fact of the matter is, is if you're going to depress wages, then you're going to have um, you know, a, a prolonged recession. Right? Because consumption is the main component of aggregate demand in an economy. And if you take away people's income and they don't spend, then how's the economy going to recover? It's not going to be through the troika or whatever. People have to actually have the confidence to spend money uh, to make the uh, domestic economy grow. And if you have uh, you know, 15 to 20 percent less wages than you had before, then you know, it's not going to happen. So that's, that's the problem here. And it, 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 it's, it's compounded by two other things that I've mentioned here. Wages, boom, that was the fungible part. What has happened to prices in Greece? There's not much downward movement in, pri in prices in Greece. You can see little signs here and there, but not much downward movement in prices. Because of the economic structure of the country, because of regulation, because of whatever. But if you push down wages without pushing down at the same time prices, then that wage decrease is magnified. And it's magnified in terms of uh, behavior, consumption behavior of people. And finally, of course, you've been in a very long recession, and people have used up their savings. You might have a cushion of savings and things like that that uh, you might have relied on. I, I have a hunch many households in Greece no longer have that cushion at all. And with what's happening to pensions as well, the down, uh, downward curve in pensions, we have what, uh, what, what is a massive wealth effect. You know, irrespective of my, what happened to my wage, I'm much poorer anyway because I can't count on a good pension when I retire. So all this stuff is holding back, from my point of view, consumption. Uh, okay, well, there's still more problems, and um, we'll, we'll get to these. Um, you know, the banks have been recapitalized, but where's the credit flow? Um, the credit flow is not there still. You, it's very difficult to borrow money in, in, in Greece, and um, it may be getting better, but, um, you know, uh, it, it may not. Right? My point is, okay, you, you could borrow money. Even if you could borrow money, why would you? Why would you want to invest in an economy in which there is no demand? I think that's um, probably the critical question to ask. And, um, you know, the, the, I've already talked about the competitiveness issue, and I, I don't think it's primarily wages. I really think that, um, you know, you have to look at um, what, is, what is being the political discourse in this competitiveness issue. And I'm going to say something quite provocative. Um, our IMF friends, for example, um, reference Greece's cost structure with comparators. Who are the comparators? Italy? France? Germany? No. It's Romania and Bulgaria and other new accession countries to the uh, European Union. Countries with which Greece never compared itself in economic terms. Right? All of a sudden these are the new cost comparators uh, for this economy which makes the competitiveness issue uh, become almost a geopolitical one. Uh, rather than a simply economic one. So, um, in addition to the wage issue in the Greek labor market, there's a huge problem, and this was mentioned also by Christina in her opening remarks, of people who are at work and not being paid. Right? They're at work and not being paid. By international definition provided by the ILO, they are counted as employed but they're really not being employed you know, if they're not being paid. In addition to that, there's undeclared work, synonymous almost with the concept of informality. In other words, people who are at work but don't have any particular social protection coverage because their work is undeclared. That's a huge problem. We don't have a lot of data on this. My best, uh, nor do we have data on the people not being paid, on the wage arrears. My, my best guess is that they're both increasing uh, over these past five years of, uh, of recession in the economy. There are people who, there is a minimum wage, even though it has been uh, uh, downsized, right? but there's 200,000 200, people in the uh, Greek labor market who don't get the minimum wage. Right? We call that the working poor. In other words, they get a salary of some sort, but they can't live on it. So this also creates other tensions in the labor market, such as dual job holding, uh, increased informality, quite frankly, 
uh, in order to make ends meet. And then finally, there's this question of the outward migration of the, um, of the, of the unskilled, uh, and, and, and excuse me, of the skilled as well. People uh, upon whom Greece's future will rely with a recovery have left the country right, or are leaving the country at rates that are um, unenviable. They need to come back. So um, here's, these are just the numbers here, you know, uh, increased uh, poverty, 33% 30, of the Greek uh, population is poor by Greek's own definition of its poverty line, which is usually lower than what the international definition might be. Uh, there are 300,000 households, right? not just people, individuals, but whole households who are without work in the economy. Uh, all those jobs that have been lost. And as I said before, I think we can start being worried, if we haven't been worried before, about the phenomenon of structural unemployment. Let's say that there was a huge boom next month in Greece and GDP growth rates shot up. Would the people who are currently out of the labor market find work? That's problematic. That's problematic. So I think there's you know, just tons of uh, issues here to, to bring up. Um, now, I wanted to say that um, there's been a lot of talk about the public sector and how big it is and things like that. First of all, the Greek public sector, uh, if you look at it as a share of GDP, is not necessarily unusual relative to EU terms, to EU standards. No? It's not the size of the public sector that really matters here. It's its efficiency. Does it work? No? Right, so as a share of GDP, I don't, see, I don't see the public sector as a problem. As I've shown up here, nonetheless, the public sector uh, has been downsized over the past five years. People don't seem to realize that. I mean, there's been a loss of 250,000 jobs in the public sector over this five-year recession. Uh, so I, I, I don't think that that's the question. The question is, how does the public sector work, and can it work better? That would be where I would put my money uh, if I were thinking about reform issues. Um, and finally, non-wage labor costs. You know, they're a burden uh, for some. I, I'm personally on record as saying that um, there ought to be kind of um, uh, um, a moratorium on payment of non-wage labor costs for new hires, a moratorium, not a, not a, not a permanent uh, non-payment, but a moratorium in return for a guarantee that that person does not displace a person for whom you are paying non-wage labor costs, which is, which, is, uh, uh, which is the French situation, for example. That's a French deal. Uh, and I think that might be a good idea if they are such a burden. But let's see how big a burden they are. Um, I don't expect you to read all this, but I'm looking just at the tax wedge on labor cost. Right? And if you can see, squint, and see these are a whole bunch of countries, and there are a whole bunch of numbers in those first two columns, and many go up into the 40s, many countries go up into the 40s. Greece is 34% in 2005 and 36% in 2011. That's the non-wage labor cost tax wedge in Greece. Not outrageous, I mean, I'm, I'm from the United States. Uh, and that is slightly higher than the United States, but not a heck of a lot higher than the United States, where we don't believe in you know, taxes anyway. And uh, so uh, th this, is not, this is not really what I think the issue is in, in, the, um, in, the, in the Greek economy today. Um, so let me just say something uh, uh, by way of conclusion. There's, there's the concept of a wage-led economy and the concept of a profit-led economy. Very often the same economy will be at times wage-led and at times profit-led. A wage-led economy is defined as an economy where a 1% increase in wages increases economic growth more than a 1% increase in profits do. Now we go through cycles like this in every economy or most economies. Right now, I think what we're seeing in, uh, in Greece is the problem of a, a wage-led economy depression. A wage-led economy depression. In other words, wages have uh, redu been reduced so much 
that there's no consumption in the economy. So even if there are profits, they're not going to be invested because there's no demand. So I think that's what the central issue is we're talking about here. Um, the other point to make um, is that, uh, and I don't mean to be bleak, uh, but I will be, uh, we're in this for the long haul. I think that um, to return the Greek labor market to the state it was in 2007 is going to take maybe decades, you know, maybe decades, optimistically maybe one decade. Right? In other words, the depression that has happened in the labor market um, has been, um, has been uh, devastating. There's another session after ours, after lunch, I think, that's going to take a look, I think, a bit more of the behavioral economics of what happens in a devastated labor market. Already, Christina mentioned in her opening comments uh, the notion of a lost generation. Young people, uh, and, and, and also in Commissioner Andor's remarks, young people who cannot find work for a long period of time are permanently scarred. They're permanently scarred. They'll never have the incomes that they could have had had they been able to enter the labor market. As well as all sorts of other physical, psychological, uh, emotional problems that uh, that uh, are attendant upon unemployment. So I mean, this is a this is a this is a huge crisis. It's a huge personal crisis, human crisis, in every possible way beyond economic terms. Right? So I think, yeah, okay, we returned to growth in 2014. That's terrific news, but don't count on it affecting the labor market anytime soon. Uh, and that's why I think that. Um, uh, and, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that the Troika is, is waking up to this as well, that the employment crisis is priority number one to tackle in Greece today. Thank you. Ευχαριστούμε πολύ τον Διευθυντή του Διεθνούς Γραφείου Εργασίας, ο Λόγος τον Μασιμιλιάνο Λαμάρκα, οικονομολόγο του ILO. Hello, thank you very much. So my name is Massimiliano Lamarca. Um, I'm an economist of the research department. I'm going to present of the ILO, International Labour Organization. I'm going to present some, some uh, results of uh, ongoing research made in collaboration with Michaelis Nikoforos of the Levy Institute and Lance Taylor of the New School for Economic Research. And um, um, of course, the views expressed are so my, my views and do not necessarily reflect those of the organization. Okay, let me start with the graphs we've probably seen a couple of times during this conference is uh, uh, basically the net landing position of uh, uh, sectors, uh, institutional sectors like the foreign sectors in blue, external financing and the government balance, which is the deficit, well, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a net landing, so when it's a negative is a deficit, and the private sector balance, which is basically net lending of, uh, of the private sector, including firms and consumption. So this, if you see the blue line, it represents the current account deficit, and you see two periods of uh, current account deficit uh, in the 80s and uh, in uh, uh, early, uh, 2000, starting with um, the uh, EU accession, Euro accession, and then uh, uh, my argument is that this deficit is somehow structural, which means is not very sensitive to price adjustment. And uh, uh, well, why the sources of this deficit are different from one wave in the 80s and the second wave. Uh, well, we can be sure that um, price adjustment didn't play a bigger role in both. Uh, well, the big difference, just to point out, between the first and the second is that um, during the first, first wave we had both a current account deficit and the surplus in the private sector, and the whole deficit was, the, or the, pri or the domestic sector was the, the government balance. In the second wave, uh, which followed form of liberalization of the financial market and accessions, we had also the private sectors um, being in deficit, which hints at also a form of cost of, uh, let's say, capital flows push 
that allowed for credit expansion and allowed for uh, GDP growth and therefore rising imports, which uh, is the counterpart with the trade balance of the uh, current account uh, deficit. So let me show here the profile of the government balance government balance in blue and the primary government balance in, in green and see how the interest payment profile affected the government balance. I would rather show this inflation profile, high inflation during the 80s but low inflation during the last, say, wave of current account deficit. And let me show the sensitivity to income of export. Oh, this is the imports. So we have uh, the real GDP of Greece. On the x-axis and on the y-axis, we have uh, a real imports. And we see that the sensitivity has increased in the last years. So that explains how imports soared with, uh, um, with the growth of the economy during the last boom. Same for sensitivity of exports to uh, the real GDP of the, um, of the European Union. And although, well, it increased, but not that much. Some recent events, employment, and you can you know about GDP, very similar, what happened. Redistribution effect during the crisis. We have uh, uh, basically profits, the red line, wages, the blue line, and taxes-less subsidies, the green line, so the decomposition of value added. And we see why there was a trend toward profits going down with the crisis, the profit share increased and the wage share declined. So what happened? It happened that, well, this is probably the most important uh, picture, exp expenditure decomposition. It's we have a GDP and breaking down the consumption, investment, exports, and imports. Uh, and uh, what we see with the decline of the GDP was mostly decline on consumption, a decline of imports, mostly due to collapse in, in, uh, in income, very, uh, very little increase in exports, and uh, a decline in investment. Um, yes, from the macro picture to a sectoral analysis, I would like to show you the uh, productivity gains, reallocation gains, uh, the sum up to have uh, the global uh, productivity increase within the economy during the period, this is 95, 2007, to see what the world sectors that uh, were contributing to productivity growth. And we see the primary sector well, at the negative productivity gain, but the positive allocation effect, meaning that um, um, with the decline in the labor employment in the labor sector, which is low productivity, in, in, in the agricultural sector, which is a low productivity, produce a reallocation effect within the economy. Industry has a, a positive productivity increase, but not high compared to standards around like some other can see two percent construction and then we have uh, trade tra retail, retail um, uh, hotel and uh, transportation basically or related to tourism had a, a larger productivity gain and then we had uh, the financial sector uh, real estate and rents had a negative but still as the productivity was uh, was relatively high, then we had a positive reallocation effect and other services. This is a profile of uh, uh, employment. Empl basically, this, this is the employment in the different industries. We, we have exactly uh, an increase in, a, let's say, call it the TR, HR, TC, uh, uh, trade retail and uh, uh, hotels and uh, uh, and uh, something like related to tourism increasing, other services increasing, 
primary decreasing sharply, industry decre decreasing, and uh, well, the um, financial industry increasing together with construction in this show. What was the employment effect before the crisis? Uh, well, the employment effect was definitely we had uh, employment to population ratio growing, mostly because output per capita was growing uh, faster than labor productivity growth. And then we had uh, that mostly in, uh, in this sector, TR, HR, CT, related to, again, to, to, the, to the tourism. Um, with the output capital growing much faster than labor activity growth. And then uh, um, with the primary sector with a negative uh, effect. And uh, uh, well, I mean, we see the profile of industry is not very um, um, comforting. So let me talk just a moment about uh, uh, the part of the project is a uh, constructed model, which is a, a general, let's call it like a CG computational general equilibrium model, which is a multi sectoral model that will help understanding macroeconomic situation through analysis of the different sectors. And this model is based on social accounting metrics, is based on uh, the elements that we just seen before. So uh, expenditure decomposition, but also decomposition by, by uses, but also uh, by, by sector. And with this sectoral analysis, we're trying to assess, describe, explain uh, what, how is, uh, is this crisis unfolding with uh, uh, the shock. We, we know uh, it's uh, a cut in wages, through cutting bargaining power, minimum wages, a cut in, in uh, fiscal spending, and a rise in taxation, and uh, um, well, and in the hope that basically the exports will somehow offset, offset the decrease in domestic demand. So the model is relatively simple and straightforward for for given given the complexity of, of uh, the situation, and it produces uh, some uh, factual results, which uh, basically is that um, these um, policies have reduced wages more than uh, prices and exports as being minimum, and confirming the fact that export, uh, the sensitivity of exports to price adjustment are very low. So we're trying to run also an experiment and having a very optimistic view about export elasticities and see whether with high export elasticities and high contribution to exporting sectors, uh, this pattern can be uh, can somehow reversed. That can, is it possible to have an export-led recovery under these, uh, let's say, programs? Oh, here we have uh, uh, six sectors. The green is agriculture. The, the, the <clears throat> green is gray is mining, mining and quarrying. Uh, so we have industry in pink. Yellow is a tourism. Uh, um, blue is uh, maritime transportation. And the other is other, other uh, services. So we have the real trade balance before and after the shock on the upper, the two upper panel, and we have a real trade balance in levels before and after per sector vis-a-vis -vis the European Union on the left and on the right vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. So luckily, uh, well, with this shock, we have an improvement of the trade balance for all, basically all the sectors which is due both to uh, export increase with these optimistic uh, assumptions on uh, export elasticities and mostly by import contraction. We have a percentage change here. We can see that uh, tourism is contributing, uh, maritime transport is contributing, having like a positive effect, and therefore will contribute to GDP growth, and also other services somehow contributing 
very little contribution in manufacturing. But the final result is still very daunting. And we have a, a percentage change in this first panel, a percentage change on incomes and other balances, why is GDP, uh, YB is uh, the GDP of business sector, uh, then we have incomes of uh, uh, households, then we have savings of business sector, we have savings of the government, we have savings of household as H. Trade balance is slightly improving. Well, it, it is definitely improving in, with this simulation, as I said, it's very optimistic about the trade elasticities. And so in, you see the current account vis-a-vis -vis the EU and the uh, foreign sector. What happened to consumption is still, well, is of, of course cons uh, collapsing due to, due to wage restriction cuts. Employment is not increasing, as you can see also by sector, with the biggest reduction in the other services, and not even increasing in the manufacturing. And uh, uh, the value added, so uh, even if taking into account uh, the effect of exports, is not increasing. So I find it very hard to uh, find uh, um, um, that uh, such uh, contractual policies can have an effect on uh, positive effect, uh, even in the long run, on, um, on, on GDP through exports. But what is missing in this picture is investment. Investment is probably, probably well, the most difficult thing to, to model because it depends on expectations very much. It depends on confidence. And what was also the idea of, uh, uh, of um, implementing the, the current policies was to have an investment boom due to a rebuilt in confidence. Rebuilding confidence, probably uh, uh, investment climate, due to maybe um, a reduction in the debt to GDP ratio over time, due to improvement in, in the credit market conditions and things like that. We all know that this didn't happen. Investment went down, and this goes brings me to the last and concluding slide, which is. Well, we argued and showed that wage price and deficit uh, work in a, in a ne negative way, let's say, uh, when the current account is structural, so that wage reduction didn't produce the price reduction. Desired price reduction or price reduction also didn't allow for exporting out your way out of the crisis and that uh, the concept of competitiveness is quite elusive, as my colleague explained what competitiveness really means. Um, so what is needed is, of course, some external financing, a different profile of adjustment, uh, which is in terms of time of adjustment, but also a need for a climate for investment and uh, here, I believe uh, the key uh, point would be uh, rebuild the so social dialogue, which means that um, investment and productivity and, and, uh, and economic growth cannot be rebuilt in expectation that there will be credit market, improvement in credit market condition with a collapse in the GDP. But uh, also a uh, recent uh, IMF report, uh, uh, Article 4 consultation, mentioned the need of um, more ownership of the programs. And I think that social dialogue, that includes all the new partners, uh, is the form to achieve uh, ownership and the climate for investment. It, it last, of course, targeted policies are needed. And then we can be discussed maybe in another presentation. Thank you very much. Ευχαριστούμε πολύ τον Μασιμιλιάνο Λαμάρκα. Το λόγο έχει η Ράνια Ντονοπούλου, οικονομολόγος του Λέβη. Uh, 
Καλημέρα σας. Θα προσπαθήσω να συμπυκνώσω λίγο αυτά που έχω προετοιμάσει σήμερα για τη συζήτησή μας. Επίσης, ίσως να δυσκολέψω λίγο α, τους, α, τις μεταφράστριές μας, γιατί θα πω ορισμένα πράγματα στα ελληνικά και ορισμένα στα αγγλικά. Ε, ευχαριστώ πολύ για την, α, για την ανταπόκριση σας σε αυτή τη δυσκολία που θα σας φέρω. Λοιπόν, um, we have listened uh, so far to very interesting presentations over uh, the, the last day and a half, and with the exception of the uh, representative of the ECB, I think there is general consensus that the austerity policies are definitely not producing the, any desirable effects. We've heard from the people that were here from uh, Citigroup, for example, and from Barclays, that austerity is not working, it is clear for them as well, and that a regime of growth, in quotations I will put reconstruction really, is uh, badly needed at this point in Greece. We have also heard many um, suggestions, many uh, analysis, much analysis, about the flaws of the European Union edifice and how it needs to be modified. Included were ideas about um, a fiscal union, a reformulated uh, monetary union where the ECB will start functioning and fulfilling um, obligations that at this point is not, including the provisioning of security of deposits, something that is uh, under discussion. Um, and I want to add to that, because it is very much linked to what we will be discussing, um, the following idea. When, the, uh, when one looks at the various treaties, uh, basically, the Ma Ma Maastricht Treaty is by putting the 3% um, deficit restriction to GDP and the 60% uh, debt uh, restriction, again, to GDP, um, is imposing, so to speak, a, a, an environment and it provides some constraints that gives guidance to countries what they should do, how they should behave, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to debate that. What I am going to debate is that when we speak about a rethinking of the European Union and its institutions, one element that is missing and is missing and we are realizing it now is the target of employment and the target of decent job creation. This is what um, our speaker that would not be with us mentioned. But if we do not understand that there is a connection between economic policies and social policies, and we cannot treat them autonomously, separately, in different divisions, then we are not going to end up with a social Europe. It is an economic policy, the policy of austerity, that is going to allow us to very quickly, presumably, generate primary surpluses. But that economic policy has a social content. Likewise, what is the social content? The disaster that we have all experienced. Likewise, when you implement and introduce ideas about social policy, uh, we have to understand that there, is, there are economic consequences to that as well. So switching now to what I am going to talk about um, today. The, um, okay, I want to run um, through a few graphs very quickly. Um, I begin with the government spending disposable income and consumption expenditures, just summarizing uh, in one shot what other speakers have shown us already, uh, so you can see very 
clearly that all three have been declining. I also want to bring your attention to recent, the most recent data by the Bank of Greece on major purchases and savings, consumer sentiment, which is still going down, and finally, if you were to look at the economic sentiment indicator for Greece, it is still not going up, contrary to what we hear. Finally, one quick remark on the unemployment rate that was at 12% at the time that we signed the first memorandum in the first bailout package, and it has now been over 20, uh, it's over 27% going north. Now, if you look at the comparison between 2008 and 2013, you will see that the only country that has seen its uh, unemployment rate go down is Germany. That is debated as to how they have achieved this through active labor market policies, but we don't have time to enter that discussion here. What you can see is that every single country has experienced an increase in their unemployment rate. Yes, it has been a very difficult time for uh, Europe, but you will identify some countries actually that are doing everything right. We heard yesterday somebody mentioned Bulgaria that is running a primary surplus and nonetheless unemployment is increasing. So how are we to respond to unemployment? I want to take um, one minute of your time to say the following. Unemployment uh, Handling unemployment among youth, which has been the primary focus of active labor market policies in Greece in the second phase that Christina talked about earlier, um, is of course um, meaningful and we definitely need to address high unemployment rates among the youth. But when you look at the whole picture and you are devising a strategy for your unemployment policies in Greece uh, at the moment, and not only for Greece, as you will see in a moment, what really matters is the share of the youth in the unemployed. And if you look at the shares, the shares are very small. Take the 1.3 million people in Greece that are unemployed. 173,000 are the youth group. So if you plan and you devise a set of policies, and I'm sure uh, uh, the next speaker will elaborate on this, um, if you devise a policy that says we are dealing with unemployment, here is a package of interventions that will help out one way or the other, but you're addressing only such a small portion of the unemployed. I know it sounds good. We care for the youth. We really want to handle unemployment for our most vulnerable. But equally vulnerable are the 423,000 individuals that are below the poverty line in Greece and are not young. So, Overall, this is the story actually for EU27 and the uh, Eurogroup as well. Um, in Greece, the youth actually comprise 13%. So, what is to be done? Number one, we have any intervention must not focus whatsoever at this point in Greece on employability, apascholisimotita should not because we have skilled people that are migrating even if there is such a problem that is a tiny problem that we are facing right now it is not a supply of labor issue that we have other speakers have clearly uh, showed that the problem that we have is lack of demand for labor so if you have lack for demand for labor, lack of demand for labor, what does it mean? Both in this country and throughout Europe, what does it mean? It means that the private sector cannot generate the jobs. So in a period where the private sector cannot, is unable to generate jobs. In a period where even if you do not have the government cutting down jobs, even if you did not have the severity of austerity, whether it is the bailout packages or whatever brings about unemployment, unemployment that is 10%, 15%, 20%, 
And you know that the root of it is that the private sector is ailing, is not capable of doing it. What should the response be? I want to propose that there are only two options, really, that you have. If you tell me that you're going to help the private sector, well, yes, you should be helping the private sector. You should have banks that are lending to the private sector, and you should do that. But apparently, whatever you're doing in that domain is failing. The private sector, the small businesses, and the larger businesses are not responding. What else can you do? What you should not do is the active labor market policies that are essentially transfer. It's a transfer of money policy. It's a cash transfer policy. Call it that then. And say that you want to support incomes through cash transfers because you want to help people's incomes. But don't call it an employment policy. Not an unemployment policy because it is not. So what is the alternative? Well, we know that we have unemployment benefits, of course. How long should they last? In Greece, they last for one year. Let me put the following provocative statement. Extend it to two years, three years, four years. How many years are you going to be handling unemployment when we have the study from Yese that says, given where we are today, it's going to take 20 years to recover. Are you going to be giving unemployment benefits and cash transfers for 20 years to people until jobs get created? What is the alternative? The alternative is Minsky's suggestion. Minsky proposed that when the private sector cannot produce jobs, it is the responsibility of the state to provide jobs on a temporary basis, meaning as soon as the participating worker can find alternative employment that pays better, that worker will exit the program. It is not a for life. It is not a stage kind of program that ELR presents us. ELR has the following three tenets. One, it is a macroeconomic stabilization policy. It recognizes that when you have the sum of wages in an economy declining because people are getting fired, demand is going to suffer. Therefore, you need job support. And that job support can only come from the state because the state can disconnect in the labor market the notion that you hire for profitability. The businesses are doing their business, and they are right in that. They will hire when hiring a worker is profitable. So who can disconnect that? Only the state. So it is a macroeconomic stabilization policy. Therefore, such an intervention becomes big, huge, when you have 25 and 30 percent unemployment in an economy, and shrinks down to zero when you don't have a problem of unemployment. Second, this suggestion says, his proposal says, that you are effectively putting a floor to the wage because there is a wage that is being offered, and you would not have the phenomenon of full-time work today in Greece for 250 and 300 euros. And, of course, observing all of the labor uh, rights and conditions that prevail in the country, you are not allowing the flourishing of um, a, a black market uh, informal labor. Finally, it allows labor, labor that is the best and strongest resource that the country has, it allows it to produce meaningful things needed at the community level. An experiment of that nature is Kinoniki Ergasia. It started under uh, Katseli, if you recall. The program was too small and the program was not able to produce neither the macroeconomic results that I will show you in a minute because I know I'm running out of time. So let me very quickly say um, what the proposal is all about. We have created and we have costed four different scenarios of an employment of last resort policy. When the original Kinoniki Ergasia program was announced, it was for 55,000 people, 250,000, closer to 300,000 actually, showed up. And they said they wanted to participate in the program. So we know that the lower boundary for a true and meaningful program of the employer of last resort, or let's call it expanded Kinofelia Ergasia, 
should be addressing at least 250,000. What we have estimated, in fact, is that in the fourth scenario, is that the correct number should be closer to half a million jobs. Half a million jobs? Yes, half a million jobs. And I want to show you just one of these scenarios so that we understand what we are talking about. If you had such a program for 550,000 jobs, it would cost 7 billion, 7 billion per year, not 2.2, not 3 billion over two years or three years or a year and a half. This is the cost. This cost includes all the legal contributions, employer and employee contributions, administrative costs, and 40% of this cost is not wages, it is intermediate consumption, all the materials that you need to use in order to deliver the work that is needed at the community level. Now, please notice that when you create these 550,000 jobs directly, you are also going to be generating 155,000 jobs else in the economy because of the multipliers that exist within the Greek structure of the economy. Notice that you will have an increase in government revenue by close to 4 billion. These are the direct and indirect taxes, all the contributions that all of this work will be creating. Therefore, the net cost between, if you look at the 7.1 billion and the 4 billion here, we get a net cost of 3 billion. So we are talking about 3 billion net cost in order to create not 550, but the total of 700,000, 713 jobs, 713,000 jobs for 3 billion annually. This is what is needed, and this is what is needed today. It is a proposal. There are equal uh, equivalent scenario for a wage of 781 that yield much stronger results. And we will be presenting this, um, I believe, end of November or mid-January uh, back in Athens, where we will focus in all of the details for such a program. As to where will the financing come from, you will hear some suggestions from Dimitri Papadimitriou later, but the speakers in the first uh, two um, presentations, in the first two presentations today, I want to use, what was the term that you use. Was it G, Robert? Yeah. Um, so there are plenty of suggestions that are floating as to where the money will come from. And uh, in fact, if we have any time uh, at the end and you would like to ask uh, further details, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Η καθηγήτρια Μαρία Καραμεσίνη έχει το λόγο. Η κυρία Κοψίνη έκανε μια πολύ καλή εισαγωγή για το θέμα το οποίο εγώ θα σας αναπτύξω. Ε, για λόγους ευγένειας, δεν ξέρω αν ήταν σωστό βέβαια αυτό, προτίμασα την ομιλία μου στα αγγλικά ε, και γι' αυτό να μου συγχωρήσει το ελληνικό ακροατήριο την γλώσσα. Ε, θα ήθελα να πω επίσης ότι ο κύριος Κάμπελ από το ILO, έκανε μια πολύ καλή παρατήρηση ε, πάνω στο, ε, στη, στο χαρακτήρα της ε, ύφεση την οποία ε, αυτή τη στιγμή ε, ε, περνάει η χώρα ε, και, ε, και ονόμασε αυτή του είδους την ε, ε, ύφεση ε, «Wage-led economy depression». Ε, δεν θα, ήταν, δεν θα μπο, μπορούσα να προσθέσω τίποτα περισσότερο σε αυτήν την κομβική φράση. Ε, 
Ωστόσο, η δική μου παρουσίαση είναι για, το, για άλλο θέμα, είναι για τι πολιτικέ απασχόλησει, ε, την πολιτική απασχόληση μάλλον στη διάρκεια τη ελληνική κρίση. Ε, και ε, α, η παρουσίασή μου ε, έχει να κάνει τόσο με το ποιο ήταν ο χαρακτήρα τη μέσα και είναι ο χαρακτήρα τη μέσα στην κρίση, όσο και ποιο, ποια είναι η θέση τη σε σχέση με την οικονομική πολιτική, ω προ τι διεξόδου που μπορούσε να προτείνει κανεί για το θέμα τη απασχόληση και τη ενεργία. Ε, Ξεκινώντα, ε, θα περάσω πάλι στα αγγλικά, θα περάσω μάλλον στα αγγλικά και μπορεί στο τέλο να πω και δύο λόγια στα ελληνικά. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, Greece is a test case for the assumptions of dominant economic thinking worldwide, uh, namely for two uh, assumptions. First of all, that austerity can be expansive, uh, and then that a 20 to 30 percent devaluation of wages and assets uh, can generate export-led growth um, That will, that will bring the economy to a sustainable path. Uh, the dimension, the size, and the time have important implications for the Greek depression. Uh, the, 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 the scale of fiscal consolidation is 18.5% of GDP, as is very well known, and The scale also of internal devaluation is huge by historical standards. So it is no surprise that this strategy, this exit strategy, has, been, um, has uh, arrived to failure. First of all, we have had a state-led recession that we are still having of historical dimensions, a 46% decline in investment, a depression level unemployment at 28%, and over 40% of the population living in poverty, a real wage decrease by 22% over 2009 and 2013, and a fall in wages that is not transmitted in prices, as have been said by previous speakers, Uh, that show the failure of, of internal devaluation to create growth of exports. Uh, the dominant discourse says that there is no alternative to mass destruction of uh, production capacity, to the devaluation and evacuation of human resources, and to impoverishment. Uh, my opinion is that it is the task of progressive intellectuals of progressive social and political forces to open the space for these alternatives. As Christina Kopsini said in the beginning, uh, at the opening of this uh, session, um, the uh, employment policy, uh, the context within employment policy is implemented, is very important for the role that it plays in the economy. And this is my central argument in this, in this presentation. I, I maintain that uh, the deep and protracted recession has changed the role of economic policy and its different pro pro components during the crisis uh, uh, relative to ordinary times. Uh, the first component, which is labor market flexibility has not been a tool for immediately re reducing labor costs, but also and of equal importance was its role in enabling the rise in unemployment. Unemployment benefits that are commonly thought as economic stabilizers and social shock absorbers have been lowered uh, during the crisis and entitlements have become stricter. Active labor market policies have become politically very important since these are the only policy instruments for managing exploding unemployment. It is not by, um, by, by, by chance that figures on programs and on schemes 
of beneficiaries are lacking and uh, are a top secret. Uh, this top secret has been um, re, um, not disclosed for the first time by Elias Kikilias when he was uh, the head of OEV, of the Manpower Employment Organization. Um, so uh, the character of policies of active labor market policies, as Mrs. Kopsini said in the beginning, is turning to defensive and compensating to passive, not proactive. I'm now going to elaborate on uh, the character and the different components of active labor market, of, uh, excuse me, of, a, uh, of employment policy, starting from the first component, which is labor market deregulation aimed at reducing labor costs. Uh, as uh, the Greek audience uh, very well knows, uh, labor market deregulation consisted in a drastic reduction in the protection of permanent employees against, against dismissals, which was meant to create an employment and security, uh, and thus to uh, act upon uh, wage reductions. The weakening of collective uh, regulation of pay um, and the reduced coverage by collective agreements and the individualization, individualization of bargaining uh, was another component of labor market deregulation which was meant to directly impact on wages and labor costs. Uh, and last but not least is the lowering of the minimum wage by 22% and by 32% for youth. As a result, nominal wages fell by 20% over the, over the period 20, 2009 and 2013, and labor costs by 23% in the business sector. But expo exports rose only by 6% throughout this period. Well, let us now turn to the role of unemployment in economic adjustment. As I said in the introduction, uh, labor market deregulation is not only meant to directly impact on wage reductions. It is also meant to increase unemployment. And this is a very important thing to uh, take into account in the economic adjustment program of Greece. The skyrocketing, there, are, there is an implicit assumption that the skyrocketing of unemployment uh, should be used as a tool uh, in order to bring labor costs down. So the skyrocketing of unemployment is not only the side effect of a depressed activity resulting from fiscal consolidation and internal devaluation, it is an active variable for pushing labor costs downwards along with labor market reforms, aiming to increase flexibility. This is compatible with the, frame, the, the, the economic frameworks for national rate of unemployment and Nairu. Unemployment is unavoidable. This is the, the, the rationale behind the economic adjustment program for Greece. Unemployment is unavoidable. Uh, it is a medium-term cost. And this cost is uh, beneficial because it is going to bring long-term benefits. Now, let us turn to the second component of employment policy, which is unemployment benefits. Uh, traditionally in Greece, unemployment benefits have been a poor social shock, shock absorber. Uh, uh, currently, the, unemployment co uh, the coverage of unemployed by unemployment benefits is around 18%, it's hovering uh, around 18%. Only 26% of the unemployed who worked before becoming unemployed are covered by such benefits, and this is the important figure. The 26% coverage, which is very, very low coverage for people who previously worked, uh, has to do with long-term unemployment and the previously self-employed, which did not have access to unemployment benefits. 
as was told by previous speakers, un the long-term unemployed are, uh, represent 67% of all unemployed. Um, as unemployment benefits play a poor role as social shock absorbers, uh, it is not by surprise that active labor market policies have been mobilized uh, during this phase that we are talking about. Uh, there has been a great increase, as can be seen on the graph, uh, in beneficiaries of active labor market policies in the first half of 2011 and a stabilization afterwards. Unfortunately, as I said before, these figures are top secret and they have been, and it is thanks to Ilias Kekilias that we have been able to collect these figures and elaborate on them. There has been a renewed decrease in the second half of 2012 uh, with schemes of community employment, which uh, um, totaled 55,000 beneficiaries. And recently, in 2013, we have seen the launch of new schemes for traineeship under the voucher system. Let us see uh, the decomposition of uh, active labor market policies by type during the reference period 2009, March 2012. Uh, we can we can, um, you can see from the graph that uh, the, um, job, that, that the um, schemes on the maintenance of uh, jobs uh, take the greatest share of all uh, active labor market policy beneficiaries and announced posts. So the job uh, maintenance schemes have been implemented, and this is also to take into account, before the lowering of the minimum wage. Uh, this means that there has been a mass subsidization of labor costs so that firms maintain jobs before the reduction in the minimum wage in March 2012. Uh, between mid-2011 and the first quarter of 2012, 16 to 17 percent of all employees in the private sector were working on subsidized jobs. Uh, of course, this had an effect on dismissals. Dismissals has be, have been contained. But these schemes have failed to absorb unemployment created by lack of opportunities. It was not their purpose, anyway. Another form of schemes is the, are the job creation schemes in the, public, in the private sector, which I argue that, that had no impact at all on unemployment, or a very small impact. Job creation schemes uh, in, uh, in firms had very low participation. Difficulties of, uh, this is explained by the difficulties of firms in creating additional jobs and maintaining them for three years during a period of falling demand. At the same time, these schemes have had a very great, uh, they had a very big dead weight because firms do not create new jobs because of the subsidy. On the other hand, entrepreneurship schemes uh, were very small in scale with little effectiveness when thousands of firms were closing down during the same period. It, it is noteworthy that there have been no schemes for social entrepreneurship, uh, even though they had been announced uh, several times. The other types of schemes that have been implemented and uh, were raised up in the previous, um, in the previous uh, presentation uh, were community employment. One of them was community employment, uh, with a, very, a drawback that it was, a very, it was of very, very short duration and compensated for the drastic reduction in temporary jobs and now also of permanent jobs in municipalities. Last but not least, the training vouchers that are now the main, it is the, the main component of employment policies, 
leave the trainees alone to find a job after the end of training in the firm. These are used, these trainees, I mean, are used as the cheap labor that substitutes for hiring ordinary employees, especially in industries with high turnover. So the overall assessment that we can make from what I have presented until now points to, to the fact that in spite of the rise in the number of beneficiaries, active labor market policies have been unable to swim against the tide of mass unemployment caused by recession or of wage-led economy depression. The fall in labor costs seems unable to generate recovery through exports. Thus, labor market flexibilization has not led to a reduction of unemployment as expected by the Troika. All this, uh, all, uh, all, this having been said, I turn to the relevance of EU employment policy for uh, um, uh, giving re recipes to Greece and other peripheral countries of the Eurozone as for bringing out unemployment. The EU employment policy recommendation can be summarized, uh, summarized in the following way. Flex security, supply-side measures, and recently, hiring subsidies for job creation, which has appeared next to entrepreneurship schemes to tackle labor demand deficiencies. None of these measures are relevant in an economy that is caught in a recessionary spiral and a debt trap, and an economy whose firms face a credit crunch. The underutilization of the credit lines of the European Investment Bank to finance small and medium enterprises is a telling example. There is no way, this is my point, of tackling unemployment in Greece if austerity is not arrested and the recessionary spiral deactivated. If primary surpluses are not used to resume growth and finance the upgrade of the production system and used to repay the lenders, and not used to repay the lenders. So what are the challenges ahead? Uh, adjustment through the destruction of productive capacity and immiseration is not economically and socially sustainable in, in Greece and other countries. An alternative growth strategy is needed based on the dis redistribution of income at home, the restructuring of the uh, sovereign debt, an investment shock from abroad. In this strategy, employment policy would find the place it deserves in combating long-term unemployment and adjusting in labor force to the, and adjusting the labor force to the needs of the new development model. Broader questions and challenges were supposed to be addressed to Commissioner Andor. I will leave them because he's not here and he's not able to uh, respond. Thank you. Ευχαριστούμε πολύ, Μαρία. Έχουμε λίγο χρόνο στη διάθεσή μας για ερωτήματα. Ε, θα μου επιτρέψετε ίσως να κάνω εγώ την αρχή, εκτός αν υπάρχει μεγάλη προσφορά από κάτω. Λοιπόν. Μπορώ, νομίζω, να κάνω εγώ την αρχή. Ε, ίσως είναι ένα ερώτημα με δύο πλευρές που θα ήθελα να απαντηθεί και από τον Γενικό Διευθυντή του ILO και από την ε, κυρία Αντωνοπούλου και τους άλλους ομιλητές, αν θέλουν φυσικά. Από τη συζήτηση που έγινε, ε, εγώ τουλάχιστον κατανόησα ότι αν η απασχόληση δεν μετατραπεί σε μία μεταβλητή της μακροοικονομικής συζήτηση και για την Ελλάδα, αλλά και για το μέλλον της Ευρώπης, είναι περιττό να συζητάμε οτιδήποτε άλλο. Και από την άλλη μεριά έχουμε και καινούριες προτάσεις στο τραπέζι που αφορούν αυτό το πρόγραμμα προσφυγής στον ίστατο εργοδότη, το οποίο φαίνεται ότι είναι πάρα πολύ ενδιαφέρον, αλλά προκύπτει ένα θέμα, κατά τη γνώμη μου, από τη μια μεριά χρηματοδότηση. Ποιο θα το χρηματοδοτήσει όταν το κράτος είναι χρεοκοπημένο, 
Και από την άλλη, μήπως είναι μια επανάληψη των προγραμμάτων κοινοφελούς εργασίας. Θα ήθελα και στα δύο ερωτήματα, τα έβαλα μαζί για να κερδίσω χρόνο από εσά μια σύντομη απάντηση. Yes, please. Oh uh, yes, thanks for the question. I think that um, let's face it, you've got a, um, a European Central Bank that doesn't have employment as part of its central mandate. Um, I come from a country where there are only two mandates of the central bank, the Federal Reserve. One is price stability; the other is full employment. Uh, I think when you have a central bank that makes uh, full employment a central statutory objective, then you might get some different results in terms of considering employment as a central macroeconomic variable. Uh, I would say that over the past quarter century, perhaps 30 years, times are changing now, uh, employment has been seen merely as a residual of other macroeconomic policies, structural policies, getting prices right. You know? Nominal targets for inflation and things like this, or fiscal deficits, or debt to GDP ratios has come up. Get all those things right, and then employment is just going to trot along behind. Doesn't happen that way. It hasn't happened in Europe that way. It hasn't happened, certainly hasn't happened in Latin America that way. That swallowed every uh, hook, line, and sinker that the international financial institutions gave it. Right? So it's very clear to us at the ILO that uh, employment has somehow to be embedded as a central macroeconomic policy objective. It needs to be embedded in policy decision making here in Greece. The government makes a decision at the macroeconomic level in Greece. There should be somebody who's looking into the potential employment impact of that decision. A, a council of economic advisors or something. It strikes me that as, uh, you know, as long as we don't recognize that employment is the purpose of macroeconomic policy, I mean, why do we talk about macroeconomics anyway if it's not to improve our standards of living and our well-being, quite frankly, subject to the next uh, panel uh, discussion? Uh, as soon as we recognize that employment is actually the purpose of why we have uh, central banks and, uh, and macroeconomic policy decision-making, then, um, you know, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to linger. As I said, and I think we're, I was very consonant with, um, with, your, with your speech, I think, as well. I mean, I... Uh, I'm afraid on, uh, the unemployment problem is going to linger for a long, long time until people say it's job number one. Πρώτη ερώτησή σου, Χριστίνα, ε, θέλω να πω ότι ο Γιώργ ε, σήμερα το πρωί μας έδωσε ορισμένες πολύ χρήσιμες κατευθύνσεις ε, και νομίζω ότι ε, με αυτόν τον τρόπο εντάσσεται, ε, μπορούμε να εντάξουμε το θέμα της πλήρης απασχόλησης σαν στόχο, μακροοικονομικό στόχο, διότι ε, όταν λέμε 3% deficit να υπάρχει, ας πούμε, κάθε χρόνο. Ε, αυτό από κάπου βγήκε. Οκ, okay, εμείς μπορούμε να προτείνουμε κάτι διαφορετικό. Ότι το, ο βαθμός στον οποίο θα πρέπει το κράτος να ξοδεύει, τα έξοδα του κράτους θα πρέπει να εξασφαλίζουν ένα συγκεκριμένο target of, ε, που, να, της εργασίας. Of employment. Δηλαδή, αυτό που λέω δεν είναι κάτι ούτε καινούριο, ούτε ε, ανορθόδοξο, ας πούμε. Υπάρχει η πολιτική που λέει ότι αυτό που πρέπει να βάζουμε σαν στόχο δεν είναι καν το, αναπτυξιακό, το ποσοστό ανάπτυξης, 2-3% το χρόνο, αλλά στο, το βαθμό στον οποίο ε, δημιουργούμε θέσεις εργασίας. Είναι η διαφορά του employment targeting. It's an employment targeting macroeconomic orientation, uh, για το οποίο, αυτό για το οποίο μιλάμε. Ε, αυτό βέβαια δεν υπάρχει καθόλου μέσα στην νεοφιλελεύθερη σκέψη. Και αυτό ήταν ακριβώς ε, που, είπε, που συζήτησε η κυρία Καραμεσίνη, διότι αν βρισκόμαστε σε ένα πλαίσιο που λέει 
λιτότητα, μείωσε τις ε, κρατικές δαπάνες κλπ. Δεν υπάρχει περίπτωση να μπορέσουμε να βάλουμε κανένα πρόγραμμα εργασίας σαν αυτό για το οποίο τουλάχιστον μίλησα. Δηλαδή, δεν είναι λογικό. Πρώτα απ' όλα, δεν θα το δεχτούν σαν πρόταση μέσα σε αυτό το πλαίσιο. Αλλά δεύτερον, είναι και λίγο, ε, πώς να το πω, θεοπάλαβο. Από τη μία να έχεις όλες εκείνες τις πολιτικές πρακτικές που φέρνουν την ανεργία και από την άλλη να προτείνουμε ένα έργο κοινοφελού εργασία για να το αντιμετωπίσουμε. Δεν συμβαδίζουν αυτά τα πράγματα. Ε, στη δεύτερη ερώτησή σας, ε, πρώτα απ' όλα το πρόγραμμα ε, για αυτό που, για το οποίο μιλάμε δεν είναι πρόγραμμα, δεν είναι project. Είναι ε, μία σταθεροποιητική μακροοικονομική αντιμετώπιση του προβλήματος. Έτσι. Ενώ το άλλο εντοπίζεται στο να δώσεις κάποια ε, χρήματα σε μία εταιρεία για να κρατήσει τον ένα εργάτη που είναι πολύ μικρού μεγέθους, micro intervention, αυτό που λέμε εμείς πιάνει την καθολική οικονομία. Κα, κατά αυτόν τον τρόπο δεν νοείται πρόγραμμα για 55.000 ανθρώπους, είπαμε για 550.000 ανθρώπους ή τουλάχιστον μήνυμο 250.000. Παράλληλα, δεν νοείται πρόγραμμα για 5 μήνες εργασία το χρόνο. Έτσι. Αυτό το, το κοστολόγιο που έχουμε βγάλει είναι για 11 μήνες το χρόνο και ένα μήνα που είναι για τις διακοπές και όλα τα υπόλοιπα δικαιώματα που έρχεται ο κάθε εργαζόμενος. Λοιπόν, πού θα βρούμε τα λεφτά. Το καυτό ερώτημα. Ε, να πάρουμε λοιπόν το πρώτο νούμερο που έδωσα, ότι στην πραγματικότητα έχουμε ένα κόστος για περίπου 3 ε, δισεκατομμύρια το χρόνο. Μιλάμε για να δημιουργηθούν 713.700.000, ας τις βαφτίσουμε 700.000 δουλειέ. Ε, έχουν κάπως απαντηθεί ήδη. Να ξεκινήσω με αυτό που είπε, ο, που πρότεινε ο κύριος Άντορ, που τον ακούσαμε πριν από λίγο. Δηλαδή, μεταφράζω και εξηγούμε τι εννοώ. Την εγκαθίδρυση ενός Ευρωπαϊκού Ταμείου κατά της ανεργίας. Ευρωπαϊκό Ταμείο το οποίο προωθεί την εργασία. Προωθεί, με λίγα λόγια, a full employment agenda το οποίο κάθε χρόνο αφιερώνει, όχι έτσι όπως το είπε ο Γιώργ πριν, ε, ανάλογα με τον πληθυσμό της κάθε χώρας, το μέγεθος της οικονομίας της κάθε χώρας, αλλά ανάλογα με τις ανάγκες που προκύπτουν λόγω της ανεργίας που υπάρχει σε κάθε χώρα. Η Βουλγαρία, ας πούμε, επίσης χρειάζεται βοήθεια, η Γερμανία δεν χρειάζεται. Άρα η Γερμανία δεν παίρνει α, το αντίστοιχο ποσό. Από αυτό ή από κάποια παράλληλη ενέργεια, στο κόστος που είπα για τα τρία δις πριν, Βάζουμε 500 εκατομμύρια πάνω στην κοστολόγηση που είχαμε. Δεύτερον, αναδιάρθρωση των κονδυλίων του ΕΣΠΑ. Δηλαδή, αυτή τη στιγμή, το να υπάρχουν τα προγράμματα κατάρτισης και το ένα και το άλλο και να εξοδεύονται χρήματα δεξιά και αριστερά, προτιμότερο είναι να τα να διοργανώσουμε λίγο αυτά τα πράγματα. Από εκεί υπολογίζουμε 600. Δανειακή χρηματοδότηση από την Ευρωπαϊκή Τράπεζα Επενδύσεων. Υπάρχει η τράπεζα of investment and reconstruction που ήταν για ανατολικές χώρες ε, για να βοηθηθούν στο reconstruction. Reconstruction, Greece needs reconstruction here and now. So there can be a special lending facility that is not going to be added to the debt repayment schedule and will have a memorandum on it for the next three years. We're not saying this is going to last forever, but we need breathing space for the next two to three years. One billion. Next, um, the big issues that we are dealing with in Greece is the dealing of the tax. Idu, lipon, osi ekhun katakrasti khrimata tu elenikou dimosiu, ke osi foro diafevgun, o pleon pera pera pafta τα ήδη ε, συμφωνημένα το πώς πρέπει να ενεργήσει το κράτος για να τα μαζέψει. Αυτό που μπορεί να προταθεί είναι ότι ένα ποσοστό της φοροδιαφυγής θα πηγαίνει σε αυτό το ειδικό ταμείο, γιατί αυτό που προτείνουμε είναι να δημιουργηθεί το ταμείο και εκεί να εισραίουν πόροι από διάφορες πηγές. Η φοροδιαφυγή, λοιπόν, από τα χρήματα που μαζεύονται, Μάλιστα, μπορούμε να πούμε ότι ένα ποσοστό θα πηγαίνει σε αυτό το ταμείο. Η διαπραγμάτευση, και θα κλείσω με αυτό, η διαπραγμάτευση για μείωση των δανειακών υποχρεώσεων, μείωση των δανειακών υποχρεώσεων πληρωμής των επιτοκίων της Ελλάδας, πάλι με ένα μορατόριο για δύο με τρία χρόνια, αλλά με την ισόποση μεταβίβαση των, ε, της ε, χρηματοδότηση που θα πήγαιναν τα χρήματα με λίγα λόγια που θα πήγαιναν για να πληρωθούν τα επιτόκια, τώρα θα μεταβιβάζονται σε αυτό το ταμείο για να υποστηρίξουν ε, αυτού του είδους την πολιτική. Θέλω να πω ότι 
η συσχέτιση, νομίζω τουλάχιστον, αυτό υποψιάζομαι, ε, της αντιμετώπισης, της φοροδιαφυγής ή του να πούμε θα μειωθούν οι δανειακές υποχρεώσεις κτλ. κτλ αυτά που έχω προτείνει μέχρι τώρα. Α, όταν συνδεθούν με το καυτό πρόβλημα της ανεργίας, νομίζω ότι θα δυσκολέψει και τους εταίρους και αυτούς που φοροδιαφεύγουν να μην αναλάβουν τις ευθύνες τους. Σε μπάση περιπτώσει, η κοινωνική συνοχή δεν είναι μόνο στο να μεταβιβάζεις πόρους, είναι το να υπάρχει ένα όραμα του τι θέλουμε να κάνουμε στο μέλλον. Και αυτή τη στιγμή, αν υπάρχουν σπίτια και άνθρωποι που βρίσκονται σε πολύ δύσκολη θέση, πώς αναλαμβάνουμε όλη η υποχρέωση για να αντιμετωπίσουμε αυτό το θέμα. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Μαρία, θα ήθελα κάτι να προσθέσεις. Εγώ θα ήθελα να, ότι, ήθελα να πω ότι το σύνολο της παρουσίασής μου είχε ακριβώς αυτό το μήνυμα, ότι ε, πρέπει να δούμε το, την σχέση της πολιτικής απασχόλησης με τη μακροοικονομική πολιτική και, την γενικότερη, και γενικότερα την οικονομική πολιτική. Ε, ανάλογα με το ποιο είναι το μακροοικονομικό πλαίσιο και οι στόχοι της μακροοικονομικής πολιτικής, η, η πολιτική απασχόληση δένει και αποκτά το δικό της ειδικό, ειδικό ρόλο. Ε, σίγουρα πρέπει να κοιτάξουμε, κατά τη δική μου άποψη, πρέπει να κοιτάξουμε όταν εφαρμόζουμε πολιτικές απασχόλησης και τους τρεις τομείς της οικονομίας. Ε, να τους βλέπουμε ε, σε, σε, σε σχέση τον ένα με τον άλλον. Όταν μιλάω για τους τρεις εννοώ και τον δημόσιο και τον ιδιωτικό και τον κοινωνικό τομέα. Ε, η δική μου άποψη για την πρόταση που, που ακούστηκε από την κυρία Αντωνοπούλου είναι ότι είναι μια πάρα πολύ σωστή πρόταση γιατί προσπαθεί, ε, έτσι, τουλάχιστον στη μικρή κλίμακα στην οποία έχει εφαρμοστεί, αλλά και σε ακόμα περισσότερη κλίμακα υπάρχουν αυτά τα περιθώρια, να απευθύνεται σε μια κοινωνική ζήτηση ε, η οποία δεν καλύπτεται από τους άλλους τομείς. Από τη στιγμή όμως που βιογκώνεται πάρα πολύ το πρόγραμμα, ε, πρώτα πρώτα έχει πάρα πολλά, πολύ μεγάλα διαχειριστικά προβλήματα, δηλαδή 500.000 άνθρωποι ε, θέσεις εργασίας χρειάζεται μια πολύ μεγάλη ε, ικανότητα σχεδιασμού από την πλευρά του, τον, του κράτους, των κρατικών μηχανισμών. Απ' την, απ την άλλη μεριά πρέπει να βρεις ακριβώς αυτές τις δραστηριότητες και να μην προκαλέσει υποκαταστάσεις στους άλλους δύο τομείς, δηλαδή στον ίδιο τον κρατικό τομέα. Γνωρίζουμε δηλαδή ότι και το είπα στην παρουσίασή μου ότι τη στιγμή που φορφοντζόταν η κοινοφελή εργασία, την ίδια στιγμή απολύονται οι σχολικοί φύλακε. Άλλοι απολύθηκαν από του βρεφονιπιακού σταθμού τότε, όταν γινόταν αυτό, βρεφονιπιοκόμοι, οι οποίοι ήταν σε συμβάσεις, με προσωρινέ συμβάσει ορισμένου χρόνου ή έργου. Άρα λοιπόν το θέμα των υποκαταστάσεων και το ποια είναι η κλίμακα και πώ μπορεί αυτή η κλίμακα να υποστηριχτεί διοικητικά, είναι ένα πολύ μεγάλο ζήτημα και το οποίο, στο οποίο πρέπει κανείς να απαντήσει όταν έρθει η κατάλληλη στιγμή. Αλλά θεωρώ ότι αυτή η πρόταση είναι, πάρα πολύ, πάρα πολύ, ε, είναι, πα, είναι στη, στη σωστή κατεύθυνση ε, από τη στιγμή που μπορεί να ε, υποστηριχθεί οικονομικά. Νομίζω ότι η κυρία Αντωνοπούλου είπε τους, ε, τους φορείς που μπορούν να χρηματοδοτήσουν ε, και νομίζω ότι το πρόβλημα δεν είναι η χρηματοδότηση αυτή καθ' αυτή, είναι ο σωστός σχεδιασμός και η, και η κατά κάποιο τρόπο, η, η, ε, articulation, η, 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 η συνάρθρωση με τους υπόλοιπους τομείς της οικονομίας. Ευχαριστούμε, Μαρία. Μασιμιλιάνο, would you like to add? Ε, ερωτήσεις. Παρακαλώ. Hi. Uh, I would like to ask the gentlemen of the ILO if they believe that there was a wage bubble in Greece or that all of the 20 and 25 percent real wage decrease that has occurred was completely unnecessary. Um, if they think there was a, a wage bubble, let's say of 10, 15 percent, not, not a, a minor wage bubble, uh, do they think that it could have been achieved in any other way than increasing uh, the unemployment rate given that we're in a fixed uh, currency exchange in, in Greece, mm. and given that our external partners, not just the, the foreign governments, but their citizens themselves, don't want to keep funding Greece for five or eight or 10 years, however long it takes for Greece to become more productive, uh, less bureaucratic, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And my third question is, um, if, if it's actually easier to convince our foreign partners instead of following a, a less restrictive wage policy in Greece, so instead of 
try and keep the wages in Greece high, if it's easier to convince them to have a wage expansionary policy in their own country. So for example, Germany to start paying their citizens more, maybe that's more palatable than convincing their citizens to pay us so that we can pay ourselves uh, more, combined with some very good ideas of temporary uh, low-paid jobs to keep unemployment you know, at a more reasonable level than it is now. Mm. Thank you very much. Mm. Okay, well, I'll take a pass at those excellent questions, and perhaps my colleague uh, Massimiliano might want to add something. Um, I think there was a wage bubble. I don't think it was like uh, an enormous volcano-like you know, thing, bubble, uh, but there was a wage bubble where wages deviated from productivity increases. Um, now, let me just back up to say that, you know, wage bubble, gee, is that a bad thing? Uh, it depends upon what the situation was status quo ante in Greece. Uh, wages increased by 70% 70, 70 over three years in Korea uh, in the 1980s, largely because there was such massive repression of, uh, of uh, worker rights and wages in that country that this was catch-up time. Uh, so I don't think anybody can say that that was an enormous like asset bubble in terms of wages. Um, I can't say the same for Greece. I'd have to look into the you know, longer-term data to be able to answer the question. Was there a way of uh, doing this in a different way rather than in, uh, you know, and, uh, and um, trying to preserve an unemployment? Yeah, I think, um, I, think there, I think there was. I mean, let's face it. We were, well, my slide showed unit labor costs, right? That, that, that relates wages to output, right? What was touched? The wage bit, right? Why not the output bit? In other words, the efficiency of output, increasing productivity even more. I think that would have been um, uh, the, the solution to that. Um, the European Commission, Commissioner Andor himself, is on record at uh, yelling at Germany, saying, raise your wages. Right? And I think that's probably uh, pretty good advice uh, for reasons I also explained in, uh, in my presentation. So yeah, I think... Um, I think there were alternatives to uh, a dramatic uh, wage decline. Um, basically, my argument, and now I'm speaking as Duncan Campbell, not ILO, huh? my argument is that the wage decline overshot. Huh? And that's part of my thesis here. I think they went down too far. Huh? As, uh, as Professor showed, uh, it didn't necessarily increase e exports in going down so far. What I'm saying is that it aggravated the crisis of aggregate demand. You know, even, even more so. So I think they did overshoot, but I, I can't put the ILO on record for that statement. Thank you very much. Έχουμε χρόνο για μία ακόμη ερώτηση. Ναι, παρακαλώ. Ευχαριστώ. Καϊμάκης Νικόλαος λέγομαι, από το Ευρωπαϊκό Τμήμα του ΣΥΡΙΖΑ. Έχω την εντύπωση ότι στα δύο πάνελ για το ζήτημα της απασχόλησης υπάρχει μία έλλειψη και θέλω να έχω την άποψη των ομιλητών τουλάχιστον σε αυτό το πάνελ. Η φαιά ζώνη της οικονομίας στην Ελλάδα δεν ασχολήθηκε κανείς. Εάν δεν λυθεί αυτό το πρόβλημα, ούτε στοιχεία μπορεί να έχουμε, ούτε προοπτική μακροοικονομική σοβαρή ολοκληρωμένη Μπορούμε να κάνουμε αν δεν αντιμετωπιστεί το θέμα τη παραοικονομία, τη φαίνεται. Στην Ελλάδα μέχρι τώρα είχαμε οικοδομήσει παραγωγικέ δραστηριότητε με βάση την παραβατικότητα. Παραβατικότητα στην εισφοροδιαφυγή, παραβατικότητα στη φορολογία, παραβατικότητα στι τράπεζε, εκτείνα εξωτερικών. Και καπέλο τώρα έχουμε και την γνωστή λαϊκίστικη θεωρία: Δεν πληρώνω, δεν πληρώνω. Άρα λοιπόν. Αυτό το θέμα πρέπει να αντιμετωπιστεί. Όσον αφορά για το συνολικότερο πρόβλημα της ενεργείας, σε μία μόνη χώρα της Ευρωπαϊκής Ένωσης δεν μπορεί να λυθεί το πρόβλημα. Είναι πολύ πιο σοβαρότερο. Νομίζω ότι η κυρία Καραμεσίνη έκανε μια πάρα πολύ σαφή αναφορά στο τέλος. Υπάρχουν τρεις τομείς. Ο κοινωνικός, ο δημόσιος, ο κρατικός και ο ιδιωτικό. Ο ιδιωτικό τομέα στρέφεται προς άλλες δραστηριότητες. Έχει εγκαταλείψει την παραγωγή πια. Στρέφεται στο χρήματο οικονομικό πεδίο και εξού τον κεραυνό που φάγαμε όλοι με τα χίλια, ας πούμε, golden boys, τα οποία διαμόρφωσαν και ε, οδήγησαν την Κυρία παγκόσμια Καϊμάκη, οικονομία. Κυρία Καϊμάκη, συγγνώμη που σας ναι. διακόπτω ναι. για να διατυπωθεί ίσως και ναι, κάποια άλλη ερώτηση. Άρα λοιπόν, η Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση, επειδή 
βάλετε από τις τρεις κορυφαίες κρίσεις, δημογραφική, ενεργειακή και περιβαλλοντική, μπορεί να αναδείξει τον τρίτο τομέα του κοινωνικό, όπου θα διασφαλίσει πολιτισμική αναβάθμιση, παραγωγική δραστηριότητα, χαμηλό κόστος ε, ε, όσον αφορά την επένδυση στην εργασία, αφού θα έχουμε, δεν θα έχουμε πια την επιδότηση. Με βάση αυτά τα στοιχεία, νομίζετε ότι μπορεί ο κοινωνικός τομέας να παίξει αυτό το ρόλο. Ευχαριστώ. Αν έχουμε, δεν ξέρω, έχουμε υπερβεί το χρόνο, τρώμε χρόνο από το μεγάλο διάλειμμα, να μαζέψουμε και τις άλλες ερωτήσεις και σύντομα να δούμε μια-δυο ερωτήσεις ακόμα, αν υπάρχουν όλες. Παρακαλώ. Just a small uh, technical question from Mr. Campbell. If we start measuring U6 unemployment in Greece, will we design in Europe, will we design better policies or will we lose the focus? I'm sorry, which... which what, youth unemployment? U6, as in the US, total oh, unemployment oh, oh, oh. plus... Uh, Okay. Thank you. Oh. Υπάρχει κάποιο άλλο ερώτημα, τελευταίο. Ναι, παρακαλώ και να τελειώσουμε με τον κύριο. The question goes to Ms. Antonopoulos, yes. Um, For the past 30 years, we have seen governments doing exactly what you are proposing, actually, in the sense of that the state will take part of creating jobs versus the private sector that has failed, as you were uh, very absolutely stating. Don't you see that uh, this kind of politic, uh, this kind of policy is uh, rather failing us 30 years now, and why should we be doing the same thing uh, instead of providing the necessary motivation to private sector doing what needs to be done? Thank you. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Yes, please. Um, that was a good question. I, I'm, thank you for not addressing it to me. Um, yeah, I think if you had a U6 um, <coughs> uh, uh, indicator for Greece, it would, it would be very helpful. Why do I say that? Because we know what the unemployment rate is. Do we know what the uh, number of discouraged workers are in this country? Do you know how many people are in uh, involuntary part-time work? Uh, you know, things like that. Um, we, there are a lot of uh, open-ended questions uh, about the Greek labor market. Do we have a reliable number on undeclared work? Do we know what wage arrears are in, the, in this uh, labor market? The answer is no. So if we don't have that information, how can you design policy? Right. Now, I, I conclude with this. Um, in my country, the uh, unemployment rate has um, uh, inched upward this past month from 7.2 to 7.3 percent. And I think that sounds really good. I mean, you know, Obama could probably get elected on that again, right, if it were constitutional, which it is not. Um, Having said that, when you throw in the involuntary part-time work and the discouraged workers in the United States, the unemployment rate in the United States is about 18%. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Μαρία. Εγώ κάποιο σχόλιο θα ήθελα να κάνω μόνο στην, θα ήθελα να κάνω στην ερώτηση του κύριου Καϊμάκη. Ε, ο, ο, ο όρος παρεκονομία παραπέμπει σε πολλά πράγματα. Αν εσείς θέλετε να δηλώσετε με αυτό την αδήλωτη να την αδήλωτη εργασία, δεν είμαι σίγουρη γι' αυτό, ε, γιατί αυτή είναι... Ναι, ε? και, αυτό και αυτό προφανώς, αλλά ε, ήθελα να πω ότι η, ε, πάλι το, οικονομικό, το μακροοικονομικό πλαίσιο ε, της ύφεση αλλάζει πάλι τα δεδομένα, αλλάζει τα δεδομένα και μας υποχρεώνει να σκεφτούμε ξανά την παρεοικονομία και ποια, ποιες πλευρές πρέπει να καταπολεμήσουμε. Υπάρχει διόγκωση της παρεοικονομίας ε, μέσα από ε, δραστηριότητες οι οποίες είναι αμυντικού τύπου. Δηλαδή, πάρα πολλοί μικροί επαγγελματίε ε, δεν μπορούν να τα φέρουν βόλτα ε, και προφανώς δεν θα δηλώσουν, αν έχουν μια εργασία κλπ, θα προσπαθήσουν να την κρύψουν. Είναι μια στρατηγική επιβίωσης. Ε, οι, οι πολιτικές που αυτή τη στιγμή εφαρμόζονται, από την πλευρά της ε, φορολογικής πολιτικής, λέω, έχουν ως, με την κατάρριξη των αφορολόγητων κλπ, κλπ, έχουν ως στόχο ακριβώς να πιάσουν αυτή τη μικρή φοροδιαφυγή, τη μικρομεσαία φοροδιαφυγή, θα έλεγα. 
και έχουν αφήσει εντελώ ανεξέλεγκτη τη μεγάλη φοροδιαφυγή. Άρα η ανάλυση τη παρεοικονομία πρέπει να, να γίνει με τόσο μεγάλη σοβαρότητα όπω κάνουμε την ανάλυση τη οικονομία. Γιατί πίσω από αυτό το γενικό όρο υπάρχουν πάρα, πάρα πολλέ διαφορετικέ καταστάσει και πραγματικότητε. Αλλά σίγουρα η παρεοικονομία βοηθάει την οικονομία να μην πέσει προ τα κάτω, να μην κατρακυλήσει και πάρα πολλού ανθρώπου μέσα στην κρίση να επιβιώσουν. Ευχαριστώ, Μαρία Ράνια. Α, πρώτα, να συμφωνήσω και να ευχαριστήσω την, τη Μαρία που απάντησε πολύ στοχευμένα σε αυτό και απλώς να συμπληρώσω ότι είναι παγκόσμιο φαινόμενο ότι σε περίοδους έντονης κρίσης η παραοικονομία σε κάθε χώρα μεγαλώνει. Δηλαδή, οθούμε περισσότερες και περισσότερες μικρές επιχειρήσεις και ανθρώπους να μην δηλώνουν την εργασία του. Αν πάει κάποια να κρατήσει μια κοπέλα τώρα τα παιδάκια και βγάλει κάποια χρήματα, ας πούμε, δεν θα μπορέσει να τα δηλώσει, γιατί δεν τις φτάνουν καν να ζήσει. Οπότε, ε, είναι πολύ δύσκολο αυτό το θέμα του αμυντικού τύπου και με τι κίνητρα πρέπει να προχωρήσουμε ώστε να συνοδέψουμε και να μεταμορφώσουμε την κοινωνία σε μια κοινωνία που όλοι θέλουμε να συμμετέχουμε, να πληρώνουμε. Να ξέρουμε αυτά που πληρώνουμε, γιατί τα πληρώνουμε, να έχουν κοινωνικό και κοινοφελή στόχο, ώστε αντί να υπάρχει μόνο το τιμωρητικό, ειδικά για τις πολύ μικρές επιχειρήσεις, για πάρα πολύ μεγάλο κόσμο που είναι χαμηλών εισοδημάτων, να υπάρχει μια διαφορετική αντιμετώπιση του πολίτη από το κράτος. Τέλος πάντων, να προχωρήσω στο δεύτερο που είναι και αρκετά σημαντικό. Με ρωτήσατε γιατί σε αυτή την εποχή, ενώ έχουμε περάσει τόσα δεινά από τα stage και το ένα και το άλλο, ας πούμε, γιατί ξανα, να επαναφέρουμε μια τέτοια πρακτική. Πρώτο, θέλω να σας επισημάνω ότι ο ιδιωτικός τομέας πρέπει να βοηθηθεί. Αυτό δεν είναι ανταγωνιστικό του ιδιωτικού τομέα. Αλλά ο ιδιωτικός τομέας τι πάει να πει να, να μπορέσουμε να τον προωθήσουμε και να τον υποστηρίξουμε. Χρειάζεται κρατικός προγραμματισμός. Χρειάζεται ρευστότητα. Υπάρχουν τομείς αναπτυξιακοί, τους οποίους έχουμε αφήσει στο ελεύθερο πνεύμα της αγοράς και του κάθε ιδιώτη που θέλει ή έχει τις ικανότητες ή δεν έχει τις ικανότητες να γίνει επιχειρηματίας, να ξεκινήσει. Ακούσαμε χτες ορισμένα πράγματα ότι όταν είχαν έρθει τεράστια κεφάλαια από το Marshall Plan στην Ελλάδα, ήταν κάπου έξι οικογένειες, εφτά οικογένειες που καρποθήκανε τα πάντα και δημιουργήθηκε μια μονοπωλιακή κατάσταση στην Ελλάδα. Με λίγα λόγια τι θέλω να πω για να το συμμαζέψω. Αυτό που θέλω να πω είναι ότι κάτω από, το, από την έκφραση ιδιωτικό τομέα. Υπάρχουν πάρα πολλά τα οποία πρέπει να αναλύσουμε και να συζητήσουμε ώστε πραγματικά να βοηθήσουμε ανταγωνισμό να υπάρχει στη χώρα μας και να μπορούν να συμμετέχουν στην αναπτυξιακή προοπτική του κράτους. Αυτό χρειάζεται θεσμικό πλαίσιο. Δεν είναι η αγορά μπα τη σκύλια λέστε, χρειάζονται όρια και αυτά τα πράγματα και με μια σωστή τοποθέτηση φυσικά ο ιδιωτικό τομέα πρέπει να υποστηριχθεί. Αυτά που αναφέρατε πριν είναι όλα τα clientilist. Πώς είναι το clientilist? Το όλα το πελατειακό σύστημα μου αναφέρατε. Αν πρόκειται φυσικά να μην προχωρήσουμε σε ένα εκδημοκρατισμό, δεν έχουμε την ώρα να αναπτύξω το πρόγραμμα αυτό και πώς γίνεται, ελέγχεται από τους πολίτες. Δεν ελέγχεται από τον Δήμαρχο και δεν ελέγχεται από το Υπουργείο Εργασίας, έτσι πώς δημιουργείται αυτό. Είναι άλλο θέμα το πώς θα διοικηθεί και όλα αυτά. Ίσως να έχουμε την ευκαιρία να συμμετέχετε στην παρουσίαση που θα κάνουμε όταν θα, ε, για αυτό το συγκεκριμένο πρόγραμμα. Αλλά στη σημερινή στιγμή, αν θυμηθούμε να λύσουμε και το πρόβλημα του πελατειακού κράτους, ώστε να πούμε, επειδή ήταν πελατειακότατο το κράτος στο παρελθόν που το έκανε, αυτό βγάλτε από τη μέση, το μόνο που έχουμε να πούμε είναι okay, να δούμε τι άλλες προτάσεις υπάρχουν. Και νομίζω ότι οι προτάσεις είναι πολύ μετρημένες και αξίζει τον κόπο να εστιάσουμε σε αυτή την, σε αυτή την άποψη και την πρόταση. Ευχαριστώ. Ευχαριστώ, Ράνια. Μας μιλιάνω. Yes. Just would like to add something about the wages and as I mentioned before. So, uh, first of all, Um, I, I, I think that uh, the, uh, the mechanism wages operate during upswing and uh, during downswing, especially in a crisis, it can be very different. So whether or not wages increase, uh, you'll see increasing was, uh, was a factor reducing competitiveness. It's a different question whether now cutting wages will help restoring competitiveness. And I think that 
uh, well, competitiveness mostly uh, is uh, uh, led by productivity growth, and this requires investment. So uh, an investment in a current situation, as we described now, is not, is not possible. Uh, we can also well, wish that low wage can attract FDIs, but FDIs don't come in a crisis situation, and uh, especially if the human capital is destroyed. So um, I believe that with wages reduction is such dr drastic and uh, without productivity growth, uh, we, we cannot help uh, competitiveness. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Milianos. Εδώ νομίζω ολοκληρώσαμε και αυτό το πέμπτο κύκλο. Σα ευχαριστούμε πολύ. Ευχαριστούμε του ομιλητέ για τι διεσδυτικέ και ψύχρεμε προσεγγίσει και το κοινό που ήταν εξαιρετικό.